P42 here. When Angela Hernandez decided to go for a drive down Highway 1 in Southern California, she had no idea the Grim Reaper himself would be following her. Angela was passing through Big Sur on the way to visit her sister, when suddenly a small animal leapt out into the road ahead. Reacting on instinct, she swerved, avoiding the animal by mere inches. Unfortunately, she also managed to avoid the rest of the road while she was at it. As her car careened off course, there was a sickening moment when the world fell away beneath her, and then everything went black. When Angela awoke some time later, she found herself trapped in her wrecked car, with seawater pouring in around her ankles. The first thing that had hit her was the pain, which seemed to be radiating from every part of her body. As it turned out, she'd fractured four ribs, broken both her collarbones, ruptured blood vessels in both of her eyes, punctured a lung, and had suffered a brain hemorrhage. Angela had driven over the edge of a cliff, her vehicle smashing into the rocky beach that waited 250 feet below. If ever a car accident should have proven fatal, it was this one. And yet, somehow, Angela was alive. Trapped in the assorted collection of metal, rubber and plastic that had recently been her 2011 Jeep Patriot, and equally trapped inside her newly mangled body, Angela summoned the strength to reach for the multi-tool she kept stashed in the glove box and smashed her way out of the miraculously still intact driver's side window. Free of the wreckage, she splashed through the surf and up onto the beach where, her strength depleted, she promptly passed out. When she finally awoke several hours later, she hauled herself to her feet, which were now bare, and began to do what I suspect anyone would have done in her place scream at the top of her lungs. Well, lung. Not that it made any difference. She was 250 feet below the highway, at the bottom of a near vertical cliff. She was alone, and considering the severity of her injuries, she was running out of time. If the Grim Reaper had been following her down the highway the night before, by now he must have been tapping his foot impatiently and pointing at his watch. Suddenly, feeling an intense thirst, Angela searched the wreck of her car for the gallon of water she always kept in the trunk. But to her dismay, it was nowhere to be seen. Scavenging a severed radiator hose, she began to collect water from mossy patches along the shoreline, telling herself all the while that somebody would be along soon to rescue her. But nobody came. For the next seven days, she lived off the small amount of water she could harvest, trying in vain to find a way off the beach, as she avoided swarms of crabs and attempted to stay out of the burning sunshine. At night, she ventured as high up the cliff face as she could, trying to sleep despite the terrible pain in her body and the knowledge that she was slowly falling prey to dehydration and surely death. This was her state of mind night after night, as she lay gazing up at the Big Dipper sparkling above in the vast expanse of space. A somewhat ironic navigational landmark, well, space mark, given she had nowhere to go. But little did she know, this was all about to change. Waking up next morning in the hot Californian sun, Angela, somewhat delirious from dehydration, found herself Looking upon a mirage, there was a woman wandering along the beach below. It was a dream she'd had more than once over the previous few nights, likely her aching desire to be found manifesting itself before her very eyes. Only, this time, it wasn't. The woman was real and Angela was saved. Within hours, she had been airlifted to safety by a rescue team and reunited with her family who had searched for her relentlessly the entire time she had been missing. And what's the lesson we can all learn from this? Pack a multi-tool. Damn, it's a shame I didn't get this video sponsored by Leverman. Oh, and if an animal happens to run across your path when you're driving, run the damn thing over. Cheating death is no easy task, and it's even harder when you're on your own with limited provisions, and Mother Nature is being an utter bitch, doing everything in her considerable power to end your life. 
Yet some people have managed to do exactly that, become the stars of some of the most astonishing survival stories in human history in the process. For these people, when Death himself came calling, they did not simply go gentle into that good night. They fought that skeletal bastard back. Now, as terrifying as it must be to plummet 250 feet off a cliff, finding yourself stranded on a beach as your brain hemorrhages, there are plenty of other ways to push a human being to his limits. The Jaskon 4 was 12 miles off the coast of Nigeria when it capsized. Battered by the relentless Atlantic Ocean, the craft began to sink. Some of the 12-man crew were lost beneath the waves. Others scrambled to find their life jackets and prepared to swim for it. But for one crew member, shit was about to get real, literally. The ship's cook, Harrison O'Keen, was on the toilet. We can only imagine those first few seconds as the ship capsized and he found himself wearing the fruits of his recent labors. But Harrison soon had more pressing things to worry about. Freezing water blasted through the ship as it was swallowed whole by the ocean. And like the world's filthiest ragdoll, Harrison was swept from one cubicle to the next. Within a matter of seconds, the ship crashed into the seafloor, 1,200 feet below the surface. In pitch darkness and with water rapidly rising all around him, Harrison cried out repeatedly in the hope that he wasn't alone in the world's least capable submarine. Nobody responded. With one hand on the roof to guide him, he half stumbled, half swam from room to room, desperately searching for a stable pocket of air. In a stroke of luck, he found one, but the sense of relief did not last long. Even in the darkness, Harrison could tell this pocket of air wasn't large, and there was still a small matter of the hundred feet of freezing ocean that sat between him and the sky far above. There has perhaps never been a man more doomed to die than this. Death had arranged the pieces, rigged the board, paid off the jury, loaded the dice, and was running through a series of gentle stretches in preparation for one final swing of his scythe. The air was running out and all Harrison had for sustenance was a single can of coke he'd found half submerged nearby. His body was beginning to become saturated with dissolved nitrogen and the freezing water was gradually sapping his body of heat. At any moment, the ocean might have swallowed him entirely. Instead, it was content to leave him in stark, desolate terror for now. For 60 hours across almost three days, Harrison O'Keen remained alone at the bottom of the ocean in utter darkness, crying and praying. But the only response was the resonating echo of his own helplessness. And as the minutes ticked by, he grew colder, hungrier, more tired, and more certain that the pocket of air he had found was not to be his salvation, but his tomb. And then, the impossible happened. A faint, shimmering light appeared beneath the water, followed by a murky shadow. Suddenly, something clutched at his hand as a shape broke clear of the water. It was the goggled head of a diver staring at Harrison in astonishment. The diver was part of a team sent to recover corpses from the ship. Instead, he had found Harrison O'Keen, a living, breathing man, sat at the bottom of the sea, enjoying a Coca-Cola. Despite all odds, Harrison was saved. On reaching the surface some hours later, he vowed never to set foot on a ship again. What lesson can we learn from his ordeal? No matter how desperate you are, if the ship you're on flips upside down and starts plummeting beneath the waves, it's time to wipe, flush, and reevaluate your priorities. What's worse than being trapped at the bottom of the ocean mid shit? Well, being up shit creek with a Mexican fisherman. On November the 17th, 2012, a fisherman by the name of Jose Salvador Alvarenga departed from the southern coast of Chiapas State, Mexico. He was in a small, modest boat accompanied by a man named Esquil Cordoba. The two men had set out to catch a few tuna, sharks and mahi-mahi over the course of the next 30 hours. You know, modest fishing goals. Neither man had worked with the other before, or even spoken. Little did they know, they were about to get extremely well acquainted. Within a few hours, they were caught in a violent storm that swept them out into open ocean. The storm lasted for five full days and sent their boat careening off course, 
destroying the ship's radio and motor in the process. A search party spent two days looking for them, but eventually gave up and assumed the men had drowned. With no food, no supplies, no motor, no means of contacting help, and stuck drifting miles out in the unforgiving Pacific Ocean, the pair of fishermen had no choice but to helplessly float wherever the currents took them, surviving off what food they could catch and whatever rainwater they could collect. They ate turtles and drank their blood, consumed jellyfish, apparently you can do that, and ate whatever raw fish they could get their hands on. They even drank their own urine. Days at sea turned to weeks, and weeks turned to months. They were lost in the largest ocean on the planet. So large in fact that it covers some 32% of the total surface of the earth. It became very clear to both men that nobody was coming to rescue them. Soon, Cordoba became sick, vomiting and delirious from one too many sushi dinners. Without any chance of medical attention, he lost all hope, refused to eat, and died. Now, Alvarenga was alone, contemplating suicide as he drifted into the endless ocean. Cordoba had made Alvarenga promise that he would not consume his body, and Alvarenga agreed, keeping the corpse on the boat and even speaking to it before realising that was batshit insane and throwing his erstwhile fishing buddy overboard. Now alone, Alvarenga continued to drift, counting time by keeping track of lunar cycles and trying to solicit help from passing freighters, all of which ignored him. But on the 15th lunar cycle, something changed. In the distance was a tiny desolate island, the first sign of land in as long as Alvarenga could remember. Having no idea where it was or even if the island was inhabited, the skeletal man flung himself into the ocean, abandoned his boat and swam for the shore. At the point of exhaustion, Alvarenga crawled onto dry land and began to search frantically for any sign of life. Eventually, he found it. A 12,000 pound polar bear inexplicably charging at him on this remote tropical island and a mysterious hatch door. Oh no, sorry, that was something else. He stumbled upon a modest hut belonging to an elderly couple. He had found civilization. Alvarenga was on the Marshall Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, having completed the longest journey for a person lost at sea ever. He had been adrift for 438 days, well over a year, and had traveled across 5,500 miles of open ocean. Jose Salvador Alvarenga had survived an ordeal so impossible that many people simply refused to believe his story until records from Mexico confirmed it. So what's the lesson this time? Turtles may be cute, but if you're lost at sea, it's totally fine to slaughter them without mercy and voraciously consume their blood. Now, regular viewers might already be familiar with this next story, but for those who aren't, it must be told because it's one of the greatest examples of cheating death known to man. By the early 1900s, Ernest Shackleton was already one of the world's greatest explorers, but it was in 1914 that something truly horrifying yet remarkable happens to him and his crew. He had set out on a legendary journey to cross Antarctica on foot. This in itself is no mean feat, especially considering the technology of the time. Antarctica, after all, is a 14 million square kilometer, minus 60 degrees Celsius frozen hellscape where your only company is an overweight black and white waddling bird whose very existence is the living embodiment of eternal suffering. But what Shackleton actually faced was, believe it or not, worse. Before even reaching Antarctica, Shackleton and his men became stuck when their ship Endurance lodged itself firmly in a dense ice floe deep into the Weddell Sea, where they remained trapped for just shy of a year. Conditions became desperate. The men were forced to relocate via sleds to bleak, rocky elephant islands that lay near the Antarctic Peninsula. It was the first time their frozen boots had touched dry land in over 490 days. Not that this would have been all that comforting to the crew. The nearest human settlement was on South Georgia Island, 920 miles away, 
across a violent, hurricane-swept open ocean. But Shackleton had one thing going for him. A pair of Herculean balls that had spent the last 12 months fattening up further on a diet of penguin and seal blubber. He ordered his men to fortify a lifeboat, stuffed it with a mum's provisions, and set out with five of his best men in search of help. For 14 days, the lifeboat and its weary, battered crew travelled across the open ocean thrashed by hurricane winds. And yet, astonishingly, they made it to South Georgia Island in one piece. But the celebrations did not last long. Shackleton and his men had landed on the wrong side of the island, separated from civilization by an uncharted mountain range on a journey so perilous that British explorer Duncan Cass would later say, I do not know how they did it, except that they had to. There followed 36 hours of non-stop grueling walking, scrambling, and climbing up and down perilous mountain faces and across unnamed glaciers. Battered, bruised, and bone weary, Shackleton and his men stumbled into Stromness Whaling Station. Somehow, he had done it, and all whilst dragging those enormous balls along with him. Within three months, all 28 men of the Endurance were saved, which no doubt left our friend deaf, wondering, how the f do I kill this guy? So, what's the final lesson for today? There isn't one. Your balls aren't as big as Shackleton's, so forget it. Thanks for watching. You can now pre-order my brand new book, Stick a Flag in It, on Amazon. Link in the description. Thank you.